Welcome to another episode of our Thought Leader Series with Student Garden. Super excited to be joined by David Linke from Edu Growth today. David, welcome. Thanks very much, George. Really a pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining us. Perhaps if you could start off just by telling us a little bit about Edu Growth. Um, obviously, you're the managing director there. We'd love to kind of hear a little bit about what you guys do and um, your origins as well. So Edu Growth is a national not-for-profit with the industry hub or peak body for edtech companies and now. Remit is economic development. So it's mm -hmm. about increasing the number of ethnic companies, number of employees, the revenue they're generating by systems, processes and procedures to sort of help the sector, if you like. So we do three broad things. We have a program to help early stage companies. So those early stage founders who are thinking about building an ethnic company, how do they get from an idea to a plan? Yep. We have a series of programs we call Clear Path, which is to help scaling and establish companies get to places they can't get on their own. So we've got a CEO syndicate, we have a showcase program, yep. we um, do trade missions, that sort of stuff. And then we have what we call ecosystem where we um, basically are doing work for the whole sector. So things like we do policy work for government, we do right. research, market sizing and market intelligence to help ed tech companies, governments, and also the, the big education players and investors understand the market. We have our EdTech Innovation Network, which is where we help companies Prove product market fit and also uh, start measuring efficacy or evidence of their edtech products. And for those who are, who maybe um, have heard about edtech but don't actually know what it means, in simple layman's term, like how do you define edtech? It's a really good question because I think lots of people try and do it. Lots of yeah. people try and think about what edtech is, and you can think about it from multiple different ways. Because Australia's edtech ecosystem is focused on improving learner outcomes from existing institutions, universities, schools, TAFEs, yeah. that sort of stuff, I think about it from an institution perspective. So we define edtech really into sort of four components. Um, admin systems, so those systems that are around and running the organisation, whether, yeah. whether that's marketing systems or sales LMS, marketing, whether it's yeah. – no, no, we don't get into LMS oh, okay. yet. No, it's things like – the marketing platforms and the employee oh, platforms. Oh, I like see. That. Okay. Yep. Then we start thinking about student management. That's yep. where we start thinking about who's in a course, what are they doing, how yep. they've been credentialed. Then you start getting to learning management. So how do you deliver the course? Yep. And then the final bucket is content or learning objects. So admin systems, student management system, learning management systems and content. And in essence, it's about are you is the technology that's in the institution improving the institution from efficiencies maybe yep. or new revenue streams or things like that, or is it about improving learning outcomes for students? So mm. EdTech can fall into one of those four buckets with those predominant objectives. And is it always SaaS or it can be kind of... It doesn't always have to be SaaS. Yeah. And mainly because of an observation is that if you take in the Australian context... The 40-odd universities, they're all huge, right? Yeah. There's no small one. So they've got lots of on-prem services for sure, and especially in the school system as well. But it's predominantly, I would think it's a cloud-delivered program yeah. predominantly, but mm -hmm. there's there's lots of on-prem still. There's lots of, lots of um, certainly in schools, school land where they've got servers on site and they're delivering technology. Yeah. I think that's... We're in the tail end of that part of the business. Yeah, okay. Business. And how is the edtech sector performing in Australia? And like, what are some of the trends you're seeing kind of, you know, here in Australia? And and maybe how does that compare to, you know, the US and other markets across the world? I'd like to think that Australia is at the centre of the edtech ecosystem globally, but it's not. Yeah. Let's be realistic. So in, in Australia, there are 700 Australian ed tech companies that we track. So these are companies okay, cool. founded in Australia or by Australians offshore. More than I would have thought, to be honest. Yeah. They yeah. employ uh, 18,000 people. Wow. And they generate $3.6 billion mm. a year, of which a billion of that is offshore. And actually, if you think wow. about those 18,000 employees, 8,000 of them are offshore. So mm. Australia's market is really strong across Asia. It's predominantly selling to institutions, so it's about improving learning outcomes from schools, universities and TAPEs. If we then think about our near neighbours and the big edtech markets, for a long time the story was China. Yeah. It's more about India now yeah. and they're really big markets. China's fallen off the, off the cliff a little bit over the last couple of years with the Chinese central government making totally. changes to the way that investment and money can flow. Yeah. And then the two other big markets are the US and the UK. So... In Australia, it's a big market. It's growing really well. It's growing faster than the rest of the world. We've got, I think, about 10.7% compounding annual growth in the last 12 months, but about 16% wow. over the last three years, which is in front of other markets. 
Um, you asked me another interesting question, which I've forgotten what it was within your string of questions. I, yeah, <laughs> so it was it was the context in which the edtech market is performing relative to the US and, and um, how Australia is doing there, and then just like trends you're observing kind of within the market. Edtech companies are being forced to think about evidence in their product mm. and what impact that that product is having either on the institution, the people within it, or the learners. So I think evidence in edtech is going to be the driving force that we see over the yeah. next next years. And I don't like to refer to it because it feels like it's a, a half a century ago now, but if we think about the pandemic for a moment, mm -hmm. what we observed, I think, across the education market in Australia and in, I think everywhere in the world is that institutions deployed product without thinking, right? It was yeah. just like emergency, emergency, yeah. deploy something. And now we're in a phase where those institutions are being incredibly um, selective and focused on their tech stack and saying, wait a sec, George, you employed, you deployed this to year five spelling class. Do you really need it? Yeah. Like what's a better solution? And that might be around um, efficiencies in their expenditure or it could be really about trying to get the best learning outcomes um, balanced across the thing. So in Australia, I think those trends of evidence being important, institutions thinking about their the, what product they've got and why and what yep. solutions they're delivering, are going to force the companies to think deeply about the impact of their product and making sure evidence is at the core of what they're doing. And in terms of the ecosystem, what's it like uh, kind of at that seed round, the really kind of early stage kind of companies? Is, is that part of the market healthy? And I'm interested to know, are the majority of these companies kind of founded out of incubators within universities? And is, does that like does that represent, I don't know, maybe more more or less than 50% of like these companies that are emerging? So I'll take the second part first, which yep. is where are, where are tech companies coming from? I don't think they're coming from the formal incubator environments yep. okay. or accelerators within um, um, within universities. And in fact, I, I would I contend that the university accelerator model is in its it's either going to be pivoted and do something mm -hmm. new or it's in the end of its... its That's interesting. Story. Yeah, because I think that I think the most successful ed tech companies, and I think this is true of many of the entrepreneurs I know, just get on with it. Yeah. They don't necessarily need that formal um, hand-holding. So then go back to the next part, which was where are they coming from? I think from within university schools and tastes, we are seeing staff within those environments producing yep. ideas that they've been deploying either into their own environments, their own courses, their own stuff, or and, and you're getting some products from there. But I think generally most ed tech companies are founded by people who observe the problem yep. and think altruistically that they can make a difference. Altruistically, is that the right word? Can make a difference to it. So you don't wake up in the morning and say, hey, I want to be a really wealthy person. I'll start an ed tech company. Yeah. You wake up saying, I see kids need help with yeah, this or I need totally. students need with this and they go and fix that problem. And then the final piece, which is, is it healthy? So there are, of those 700 edtech companies, about 350 of them are what I call startups. So they yeah. are less than half a million dollars worth of revenue, still mm -hmm. building minimum viable product. Yeah. They're probably a couple of co-founders, maybe a part-time person. That market has shrunk a little bit over mm -hmm. the last couple of years. And I think that's just a natural economic cycle. We've got we've come out of a global pandemic. Totally. We're, every single cost that we have in our lives is going up. So people are being really, you know, really selective of what they're doing. So I think the edtech ecosystems in the early stage has slowed a little yep. bit. Which is like kind of a lot of um, startups generally. We've seen a bit of a less of those seed um, companies kind of popping up and receiving funding given some of the funding has kind of it's gotten tougher to raise capital in the markets that, the market that we're in currently so obviously that's impacting people's ability to kind of invest in developing the product and as you say solving the problem absolutely and and the best way to think about that venture capital stuff that's happening in the edtech space is it has literally fallen off a, yeah. a cliff you know we're talking about 20% in the last quarter compared to the same quarter the year before. Yeah, it's amazing, and isn't it? A couple of years ago that was driven by um, a lack of funding out of China, but it's just now you're not seeing a lot of venture capital going into mm. it, into any vertical, but especially totally. tech. Yeah. But what we are seeing is lots of private equity activity. So yeah. much bigger companies coming into Australia, doing big transactions. There will be a very big transaction in the Australian market in the next six to 12 months. Yep. It's happening right now where you'll see 
two or three of the very big players either acquired offshore or yep. acquired and rolled together or something. You'll yeah. see that happen. It's probably in more recent times over the last two or three years, I've kind of, the more I've kind of gone into this space, I've seen how there are some really amazing Australian ed tech businesses doing some really cool stuff and like that are really profitable as well. And they're the ones that are obviously attractive to private equity, you know, where it's like there's lots of opportunity for growth and, you know, they're, they've got decent market share and they're profitable. So it's like, it's, it's quite impressive some of the, these businesses floating around around Australia. I absolutely agree. I think if you're going to be a bigger tech company in Australia, you have to be an exporter. So if you're yeah. doing more yeah. than sort of 4 or $5 million a year, you're exporting. Yeah. You have to be. And uh, we don't have to be, but the vast majority are. Yeah. There was a really interesting transaction that happened in, I think it was like late 2021, maybe early 2022. So there was a um, a public fight for 3P loaning and that yeah. public fight happened on the public exchange and an Australian company ended up acquiring it through an incredibly interesting complex deal, which I won't go into. Yeah. But what that did was it created this global view saying, oh, wait, there's edtech companies and they're in Australia yeah. and they're really cheap compared to what we can yeah. buy anywhere else. Let's come and do some activity. We've just seen some big players come into the market. The other one is, um, can we call New Zealand part of Australia for just for the, just for, for the moment? Works we'll for go, me, mate. We'll go I've, the, I've, got, I've got a foot in each camp. All so. right, we'll, <laughs> we'll go to the, the Australian-New Zealand tech market. There was a mega deal happened in um, New Zealand about 18 months ago, which is a uh, very large KKR and I think BlackRock yep. acquired um, Education Perfect for $525 oh, yeah. million, dollars, which created really a global view. So the, the market... Of those two or three big deals, the market's really hotting up. And what I'm seeing right now is that you've got companies who have not been able to raise the next round or maybe conserving cash um, uh, burn runway, run, runway. They're looking for something and that may be more strategic M&A as opposed yeah. to traditional venture. And I've also observed there's quite a lot of um, PE activity across the like RTO market in terms of roll-ups of RTOs and like obviously those that are participating in that are obviously interested in you know, in tech as well. So it's um, certainly kind of an interesting time to have to whether you're starting an in tech business or whether you have one that's, you know, growing. And if you're looking for any exit or looking for a strategic partner, you know, it's it's a good time to kind of be in that space as well. For sure. And, and you're absolutely right, Jordan. The other thing I'd say is for an international ed tech player, the Australian market's probably not that interesting. Like yeah. Realistically, yeah. there's pretty small market for mm -hmm. them. If you're a, if you're a North American totally. or a, a UK company, you're not coming to Australia to acquire the Australian customer base, unless it's a strategic reason to get. Well, into as the you said, the consolidation of yeah. forty universities, right, versus thousands and thousands yeah. in the US. Yeah. But what 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 <laughs> Australia is for international companies is a, is an opportunity to build out their export capability yeah. and then move into Asia because it is mm. there is decades of experience of Australian um, education being exported to Asia, which is, you know, interesting for them. Mm. And you mentioned kind of those four um, key areas in terms of kind of um, how you define e tech broadly. What are some of the kind of advancements and trends and like technology that you're kind of seeing? Obviously, you know, we're on the AI hype train at the moment. Are you seeing much um, in the kind of AI, in the AI thematic in terms of emerging e techs? I'm sure there's tons of established ones, obviously, embedding AI into their businesses or it's already in there. But yeah, what are you kind of seeing in terms of emerging trends? Well, every the company is now an AI company, yeah. so, isn't they? Like that's what I'm hearing. Everyone's yeah. talking about deploying AI into their into their product. I think at the moment, as far as artificial intelligence is concerned, it's going to impact the market for sure. Yeah. Can I predict what it's going to look like? Well, you know, be a very wealthy man if yeah. that was the case. But I think that it, AI is going to impact all sorts of things. And I think about the way that we may think about an institution. So let's just take a university for a moment. Yep. And we think about those four domains I mentioned before. And we say right at the heart of this institution is teaching and learning, right? That's their core business. Yep. That's what they do every day. That's what they get up for. That's what they're paid to do. Then the next layer out might be learning delivery and how do you do that and how do you give them systems to do that smart. And the next layer out might be student management. The next layer out might be admin. And we're getting more complex and you, I'm sure we can start thinking about yep. research and stuff like that. And I think about, well, where where will artificial intelligence play its first pl play in the education space and where will it be its last? I'm going to say 
Every educator that I've ever met is reasonably conservative, yeah. quite rightly. <laughs> yeah, I, I can guess the last part. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're, they're very conservative and their job is to be conservative. They're dealing with people's lives, so I'm yeah. very comfortable with that. So I think they're likely to start on the outside and come yeah. in. And so teaching and learning will be the last domain. It doesn't necessarily mean it should be. It's just where that I think it might yeah. be. I think we're going to end up seeing AI will be deployed. I can see, and it exists today, you know, like I'm a university student. I go to my... Thing. It's like, where's my lecture again? I forgot where yeah. it is. What's the date that I have to submit this thing? And someone and a chatbot responding to you and telling you those yep. things. Do I think that we're going to get AI into the point of it's still bleeding edge, right? So yep. are we going to get AI into the point that I'm going to teach this child to read purely using AI? I'm sure that's going to happen, but I don't think it's tomorrow. Yeah, agree. I agree. I don't know how far it is because these things are what's Moore's law. It's going yeah, to be of far. course. Yeah, I don't know when it will be, but yeah. it will come for sure. Yeah, cool. And I'd love to get some insight into, again, you've like had such amazing exposure to, you know, this kind of ecosystem and the businesses working across it. I'd love to kind of hear an example of, you know, a successful ed tech business that you have kind of see come through the ecosystem. And I guess whether you guys played a role or not, talking to kind of how they were able to kind of achieve success within this, the Australian market. So... Um, um, it, it's a bit like asking me to pick which is my favorite yeah. child. I won't pick one particular company, but what I'll talk about is some companies that I've seen that yeah, are interesting things. So there are there are companies that come immediately to mind who have been intimately involved with Edge Growth from our very mm-hmm. first days, where they got their seed funding through our program. They received their first, oh sorry, their pre-seed, then they received the seed, and they've gone and they're now doing M and A activity. Um, and selling to universities around the world and great success mm-hmm. stories. The, the people that I more think about it is we did a project with the Victorian government. I can't remember the time frame, 2021, 2022 maybe. And it was a program we called the EdTech Innovation Alliance. And it was this model of how do we help EdTech companies connect to international markets with, with the support of these existing infrastructure and players and stakeholders. So we, we created a model in which a Victorian EdTech company had to find a Victorian school or university or TAFE. And they then had to find one offshore, a, a same school, university or TAFE. Yep. In fact, the schools were a couple, I think. Then we paired them with a university researcher and they deployed their product in a co-design model with their customer both here and offshore and they um, uh, measured the efficacy. Right? Love so the model. Yeah. The end result of that program is of those nine projects, eight of them signed commercial deals Amazing. with their Victorian and their international partner. At the moment, we are at about $11 million annual recurring revenue. Those companies are generating awesome. from those partnerships. And I think it's three, it might be four, went on to raise capital. I'd like to say it was all because of the work in the project. I'm sure it was just another data point, but that's about $13 million worth of capital we've raised. And then the question is, why is that program not currently running? Because that sounds amazing. <laughs> well, it's it is. It is. We've, <laughs> we've changed the model a little bit. So the model, the first version of it was funded as a grant through the Victorian yep. government. And really that's what governments do. They see things, they see ideas, they listen to the industry and they invest and they invested mm. and they showed the market that's given us the confidence to go and build a commercial model around that so we have in what we call the edtech innovation network we're launching the higher ed space our our foundation partner is western sydney university who have come on board and said yep let's do this we will by the end of the year announce another half a dozen universities who will partner with us and if there's anyone listening and wants to become a yep. partner in that program please reach out to us but the idea is to ensure that companies can get access for product market fit yeah. get do proof of concepts and do efficacy analysis so that we can show back to the thing I said, you know, 20 minutes ago, how do we help tech companies build evidence records? Yeah, it's, I mean, like I remember years, like years ago, probably seven or eight years ago, when we had, uh, we were developing our product, our lead generation product within the property market, it's called Lead Tech. And I remember at the time, you know, we really wanted to, partner up with some with some, a researcher kind of doing some data science work with us to try and help us to better kind of understand both the opportunity and the impact of the technology that we developed. And I remember it was like really difficult. We ended up finding someone, but I remember that whole process was like really difficult. And I was thinking at the time, I was like, I'm sure this would be an amazing project for someone to work to like a partner with us. We're here. We've got this opportunity to commercialize it. We're obviously willing to pay for it. How do we kind of access those people? So it's like, I mean, like you're obviously, that's one part of what you're just describing. But I think the ability to kind of connect businesses 
obviously to be able to validate it within the, the environment, like within the institution or the university, but to be able to kind of partner with students or researchers working within those organizations, I reckon is such a great way to kind of ensure or like help the likelihood that these businesses are going to be successful. You're absolutely right. The key to it, and one of the really interesting things is what role did those researchers play in those projects? Mm. And I'm not sure that anyone would articulate in exactly the same language that I'm about to because of the because I'm going to take a commercial slant, yep. not a research slant. I think the role they played was chief product officer. Yeah. I don't think they would think yeah, I like that. that. Yeah. But they, what they really did was they said, George, great idea, fantastic. You're going to change the entire way. I think you were talking about a lead generation yep, real estate. Yeah. You're going to change the way every real estate agent works. Awesome, fantastic. How about we just start with one Yeah. And prove that we can do that? And they, they just kept bringing them back to rigorous thought through product development and impact measures yeah. so that the, the, the ed tech entrepreneur actually had a plan that said, oh, yeah, we're going to work in the math space, but instead of trying to do this across 15 different data points, we're going to pick three data points and we're going to be really good at those and we're going to articulate our story and our narrative. So that was the first piece of it. But there's another, let's take the opposite view and say from a researcher's perspective, researchers could be, accused of living in ivory towers, right? They could be accused of not being in yep. the commercial world. Every researcher that I've worked with have a very commercial bent mm. and they have very similar requirements to scale up companies. They've got to find funding. They've got to keep yeah, their staff employed. True. They've got to keep that lab yep. going. So there's a lot of similarities. Yeah. So what the EdTech Innovation Alliance and now network is designed to do is to build a scaffolded framework yep. so that researchers can engage Take an, a, a really simple microcosm. Every research lab that I've seen has a whole bunch of PhD students. Mm -hmm. So these are incredibly bright, incredibly smart, incredibly engaged people who are now saying, please, how can yeah. I help you? How can I take my skill and yeah. help you? And it's 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 almost philanthropy because that you don't pay them. They're they're paying to be part of the program. Well, this I was wondering. I was kind of there. wondering that, yeah. It's ridiculous. So yeah, that, that in our model, we have a commercial like, model. Yeah, right? of course. Yeah, but the the idea of being able to help researchers connect into the industry and help industry connect to researchers are within a framework that solves problems for both. Um, yeah, and I'm definitely not surprised to hear that they were playing that product manager role, where it's you know it's kind of the curse of the entrepreneur. You'll have ten ideas, and nine will, nine will be the death of the one good one. And so if you're kind of running around trying to do 10 things at once is often where, you know, where entrepreneurs run into challenges is kind of when your focus gets stretched in kind of too many, too, too many directions. I mean, that's certainly been kind of my experience. Because you have to live in that life. Yeah. You've got to try and find what product is going to be the most, um, get the most impact and traction. But the, you're very right that sometimes if you're trying to sell eight stories instead of two stories, it just makes it more complicated yep. to do the eight. What the researchers really brought to the whole process was a focus on that's great, but that's going to have little impact or little cut through because of this other piece that yeah. you don't even know you don't know yeah. that's coming down the pathway of curriculum The changes. unknown unknowns. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And they just, it's, it's such a great thing if we can just continue to drive it. Yeah, totally. In terms of kind of looking into the future, what do you kind of see as, you know, the space? How how is it going to kind of evolve? You know, what are you excited about as we kind of look into the into the future? And where do you kind of see the biggest opportunities in the edtech space? We talked about it before around artificial intelligence, what yep. it may do. I'm very much of the belief that education is a social activity. Large part of it is not necessarily what's happening yep. in front of on a whiteboard. It's actually what's happening amongst the social and yeah. emotional components that students and learners are, are generating. So I've got no doubt that that piece will continue. We'll create new environments of how we do that online. I've got no doubt that we're going to get better at delivering learning experiences online and creating that social cohesion. Machines will do what machines are going to do really well. So they'll automate assessment and data analysis yep. and learning analytics and give insights and all that sort of stuff. But teachers will still be at the core of ensuring that you're getting some new skills and be able to create new knowledge or be able to apply that skill into, to new places. So I'm, I'm really keen about that. From a, um, a business perspective, if we pause and think about the business of education for a moment, you mentioned before consolidation in the RTO market, you mentioned consolidation in the vocational market. 
for sure. It's yeah. going to happen because there's lots of smaller players. This is true of the tech ecosystem too. So I shouldn't just yeah, that's say, true. say yeah. just of, of um, the those mid-tier providers. If we think about edtech companies and just take those that are 10 years old, 55% of them are less than $4 million a year yeah. revenue. So that just basically means there's a big consolidation. There's a lot of small a lot of enterprises in there. In there. Yeah, and yeah. so you'll see some consolidation there as well. <laughs> um, ultimately, what I think we'll end up seeing over the next sort of half a decade, if that's the case, is we'll see technology will probably not be the core thing we think about. It will actually be the education. The technology yeah. will just be an enabler because I can't imagine any of the education innovation we're trying to achieve, which is better student outcomes, yep. better data to provide insights to educators, micro-credentials to grow, you know, learner um, cohorts, which ultimately is revenue generation, diversification of revenue. I don't think any of them are not going to have a technology component to them. What's, totally. the, what's the book? I think it's something like um, Software Reading the World or something. Yeah, I yeah. can't remember this <laughs> the quote. Right? That's going to happen in yeah. education too, right? It's going, to, it's going to eat the world. Now, the question is whether AI is going to be in, in the, all of those. Yeah. yeah, great. Well, thank you so much for your time, David. We have really enjoyed um, having you on. I, I think um, some really awesome stuff happening in the EnTech ecosystem here in Australia, and you guys are obviously at the forefront of it. For people looking to connect with you and um, the team at Edu Growth, is LinkedIn the best way or the website? Or All of those channels work. Fantastic. LinkedIn, we have a very active LinkedIn program. We obviously have a whole bunch of events and programs that we deliver across the calendar year. So yeah. We have places for edtech entrepreneurs, educators, stakeholders, investors, consultants to play. And next event in August that's coming up, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so the Melbourne EdTech Summit, we run a four-day program, two days Innovation Alley at EduTech, which you're going to ask me dates, I think it's 13th, 14th of August. Great. And then we've got the Melbourne EdTech Summit, which is in the CBD on the uh, 15th and the 16th. Yep. So the first part of the week is all around entrepreneurship and innovation in schools. The end of the week is all about universities, TAFEs and workforces thinking about what the future of education at scale looks like. Brilliant. And I've uh, intend attended the event before and can definitely give it a glowing recommendation to anyone listening who's thinking about joining, get on down there. Awesome. Thanks again, David. Thanks very much. Cheers.